session two. <laughs> Grim Country Forum today being brought to you by Banner Payson Medical Center, Holiday Cruises and Tours, George Henry Plumbing, Heating and Cooling, Suites by Kim Ross, and ITD Group Computer Services. Well, good, finally, Friday morning, it's good Friday, too, four and a half minutes past nine o'clock, 69 degrees, and of course it's Friday, so you know what that means. That's right, with lips on loan from God, it's your hometown movie guys. We have Tina, Andy, and Craig with us in the studio this morning, telling us all about what's going on at Sawmill Theaters, and we have a special guest with us, too, and we're going to tell you about that here in just a moment. Well, I hope you're all having a good Friday. How's everybody doing today? We're all in our places with bright, shining faces, and you betcha, glad to be here. Oh, so glad to be here. Oh, she sounds, <laughs> you all sound so enthusiastic. <laughs> hey, we have a special guest with us today. You know, last week we were talking about uh, westerns and stuff, and I uh, had a lot of phone calls. Um, but, you know, one of the things afterwards, I was talking uh, with my friend Phil Quigley, who's with us today. Phil has been the armor, uh, which means he's provided guns for a lot of movies, and he's done a lot of, he does just some of the most exquisite uh, uh, work that I've ever seen as far as really high-end uh, uh, gun work. We're going to find out. I, I'm sure there's a, a better term to use than that. Uh, but um, Phil is with us in the studio. And uh, Phil, quickly now. First of all, you have a, a long history in law enforcement, right? Yeah, I'm retired from yeah, the yeah, service. <laughs> from, from a long time ago. Yeah. And uh, now uh, you've been working uh, guns and movies for for quite 20, some time now. Twenty-five years. Now. Yeah. And uh, give us uh, just two or three uh, the names of two or three movies that we probably know that you've uh, done work in. Well, I built guns for Quick and the Dead. Mm -hmm. I worked on Proof of Life, and I was the head armor on Master and Commander. Wow. And uh, so now you provide all the guns for these movies and make sure that everything is safe and all of that. Generally, we, we, there are a number of rental facilities, houses, production houses in California that we lease the arms from. Right. And uh, then they go on a set with us. And we, we maintain them on set, keep them clean, and right. make sure everybody's safe. Now, I've been to your shop a few times, and the work that you do, I mean, what is it actually called? You do all this really detailed filigree. I mean, you make not just really nice, or guns look really nice, but I mean, we're talking museum quality stuff. I'm a master engraver. I'm rated quite high. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, you, and you've been at that for a long time, obviously. 31 years ago. Yeah, so you're getting the hang of it. Yeah. yeah. I keep uh, practicing, I'll figure it out. Yeah, so what, some, you did a couple of guns for Russell Crowe, did you not? Oh yeah, I've done lots of, lots of firearms for many, many Hollywood stars. So, I mean, just for their personal collections. Yeah, personal and stuff, yeah. And uh, I know the two that you showed me photos of for Russell Crowe, I mean, how much time do you put into some of those? Um, I probably had three full months of work on those. On two guns? Yeah. Wow. Um, and we're talking full-time work. Yeah, I've had some firearms in this shop for a year and a half, two years. It depends on what I'm doing to them. So it would be my guess that uh, these Hollywood stars that are getting these guns from you are paying a pretty penny when you put that kind of time into it. Everybody does or I don't do the work. <laughs> yeah, that's a smart answer. I like it. Now we're going to find out a little bit more about uh, some of his experience uh, uh, with uh, various movies and in the, uh, gosh, Master and Commander. A Andy, is that not uh, one of your favorites of all time? Uh, absolutely. It's just a, a terrific movie in every aspect of it. And there's not a single zombie in the movie, yet you love it. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And, and Ditto, I, it's one of my favorites. Really? Yeah. I love that movie. And it's th very slow and very dreamy. Right. Just like being out on those ships for months. Slow and dreamy. Yes. I, know, I, know, I know about being and slow. I love Russell Crowe. I love Russell Crowe. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, now, yeah, that, that is one of the few movies that uh, there's there's nothing about it that uh, I would suggest as an improvement. Yeah. Wow. Uh, it's, I agree. Because, it, I mean, you guys usually have a suggestion for just about every movie. Well, sure, yeah. Um, but that was obviously a rule. We don't have to make them. All, <laughs> yeah. all we have to do is talk I'm about them. Criticize. <laughs> them. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But historically, yeah. very, very accurate. Yes. The uh, shipbuilders built two ships for that film alone. Mm. Really? Uh, we filmed in Mexico in the, the big tank down there at Fox Studios. In Mexico? Yeah. Really? Where, where, and whereabouts in Mexico? Well, you know where they filmed, uh, oh, that silly movie about the Titanic. Uh, it was filmed there. Really? There's a, there's a big studio down there, just below uh, Rosarita. Uh -huh. uh, the, the pond or the tank was, is five acres of water with big jet engines for smoke and wind and uh, they can create like 18 foot waves in it. It's really pretty wild. So they put just a big green screen behind it or something like well, that and we, put it in their backgrounds? Or? Green screened or some areas. When you're filming out toward the ocean, it's a. Uh, you see well, the, so you got like a negative edge right to yeah, the ocean? Right to the ocean. It looks like wow. you're way up on a cliff. Huh. But you can work on the ships in there. And, and they're mounted on gimbals and they 
rock right. and roll and roll and pitch and yawn. So now, when it comes to a movie like Master and Commander, how long were you actually there? Eight months. Eight months. Yeah, I lost 22 pounds working on a film. Wow. <laughs> and there's a lot more than just, uh, here's the guns, you guys go shoot them up. I mean, yeah. there's a lot more to it, right? There's a tremendous amount of work in the morning before you ever get started. We get up every morning at 5, go to set, be there by 6, eat some breakfast real quick. And I would leave the set around 11 o'clock at night. Wow. wow. And uh, uh, all, you did, all you did on Sunday was sleep. Yeah, I bet. And so how many different movies uh, would you guess you've, you've been a part of? Well, I've been on 14 big pictures. I've worked for, on, you know, for production companies, building stuff. For <coughs> right. Wow, very interesting. Now, uh, now we're going to come back to that a little bit. I want to tell, uh, talk for just a moment, though, of course, about all the great things going on at the Sawmill Theater. Now, uh, there's, uh, of course, you can always find out what's playing and when it's playing by just logging on to sawmilltheaters.com. But uh, the movies this week, I've uh, got some new ones. Uh, first, The Curse of La Llorona in 1970s Los Angeles, the legendary ghost La Llorona. Uh, did I get that? Am I spelling that or pronouncing that correct? La Llorona. La, La, La Llorona. La Llorona, okay. Uh, your Rona, my Rona, their Rona, you know, tomato, tomato. Anyway, uh, uh, this uh, is... My Sharona. My Sharona. Anyway, that different, uh, different uh, radio station for that one. Anyway, the legendary ghost is stalking the night and the children, ignoring the eerie warning of a troubled mother, a social worker, and her own kids are drawn into the frightening supernatural realm. Now, this is uh, another one of these spooky movies. It's rated R, plays at 1, 310, 520, and 730. What do we know about this movie so far? Yeah, you know, this one's, uh, I've gotten pretty lukewarm reviews, right. we'll leave it that way. Uh, it, this is part of the, the, uh, the people that did the Conjuring films. Oh, okay. Um, and we're, we're looking at, um, yeah, I got to watch a little bit of this the other day, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's one of these jump fright films. I was like, oh, well, look over there while we go boom, over here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this, this La Llorona means the, the weeping woman, and oh, okay. uh, she's part of a uh, uh, Hispanic culture, <coughs> yeah, I, I guess kind of a... Mm -hmm. It's kind of a large part. You know, I know a lot of people that were. Uh, my grandma used to scare me with these stories of, of the, the weeping woman. She would come for you, and, um, and, and and that's what she got with this. It's just kind of a uh, you know she. Well, she ain't any easier here. to deal with than the grumpy woman I'm talking to now. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So uh, just, just a creepy, uh, creepy old woman that jumps out and scares you. Right. Okay. Well, that's one of the movies you can go see if you like horror uh, flicks. Uh, Craig said this is the part of the uh, Conjuring universe. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the sixth. Uh, in the Conjuring films. Well, there's, there's got to be, uh, you know, some reason that they keep making more of them. Well, right? yeah, the people like to be scared. And uh, as, as Craig said, this is a, a less of a psychological uh, thriller than it is. Uh, you're just kind of have stuff jump out at you. Boost. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, jerk you out of your seats about three inches. Uh, and, uh, you know, people like that uh, to a certain, certain degree, and it doesn't cost much to make them. Right. And, uh, and, and, and you're the keeper of the numbers. How much did it cost them to make it? Seventeen million. Wow, that is a low number. Oh, by I'm sorry, today's. fifteen million. That's even a lower number yeah. by today's standards. Uh, I mean, that's, yeah. that's so, a pretty low budget. Uh, I, I, I think uh, the movies that Phil's been working on are uh, different, uh, different category budget-wise. Ma uh, Master and Commander cost a couple bucks more than that. Yeah, yeah. 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 four hundred eighty million. Four hundred eighty million. One hundred. Oh, one hundred eighty million. Wow. That's, yeah. that's and, and you know, the, this this La Llorona will, it will be number one this weekend. Is that right? Uh, these things it, it'll probably do forty, fifty million dollars over the weekend. Wow. Uh, so they'll they'll get their money back and then some. Uh, in a quick three days. Right. Of course, everything's going to a, a, kind of a quiet weekend for film, actually. Uh, you know, next week is the Avengers Endgame. Oh, um, that's going to be a biggie. Which actually, we're going to uh, we're opening that one on Thursday night next week. Oh, We've got uh, two yeah. showings at 6.30, a uh, 2D showing and a 3D showing. Uh, if I have to open up more theaters, I will. Uh, so plenty of seats available for that one, and that's going to dominate the box office for the next two, three weeks. We were, and real quick before we go to the phones, we were talking just before the show, there are some uh, estimates that we we're talking uh, 300 million the first weekend. You know, like it, it's going to, yeah, it's just pretty much a, a question of whether or not it's going to break records or, or how badly it's going to break them. Wow. It, it set the single day ticket sale record in six hours. Six hours. It, it took it six hours to break the record. So this is, uh, um, you know, what's crazy is it's hard to say this is going to be the biggest picture of the year. Because there are some huge films coming up this year, and uh, all all Disney. Wow. Uh, Disney is uh, you know this uh, Endgame, Avengers. Disney, who is now also Fox, who is uh, yes. not, I think it, what they're going to take on Maytag next or something. Like that. Yeah, it, it, it's yeah the the, the mouse is loose. Um, oh. <laughs> you know uh, we've got a uh, uh, Lion King 
They redid Lion King. That's coming out wow. in the summer. We got a Frozen 2 movie coming up at the end of the year. Do we know if this Lion King is going to be like a live action or is it more animation? It, it's, it's animated, but it's that that incredible animation they've developed now where it, it looks stuff. it looks wow. real. Wow, very interesting. Um, yeah. Now, now we got a number of other movies to tell you about and we're going to get to that too. We do have a caller on the line. That, man, we did have a caller on the line. That's our first one that we lost of the day. Sorry. Uh, uh, first <laughs> first caller that we've lost all day long. Yeah, the first caller we lost in the first few minutes you of the show. You can do better than that. Yeah, we, can, <laughs> we can lose more. We have a mission. Anyway, uh, we're going to take a quick break and when we come back, find out a little bit more about what's playing at the Sawmill Theaters and also talking with our special guest with us this morning, Phil Quigley, who has done an awful lot of uh, uh, weapon work for a number of different uh, movies and kind of get a little bit of his perspective on some of the things that he's experienced. And real quick, in case this is the people that were on the line that we lost, let's go back to the phones. Hi, you're on Rim Country Forum. Good morning. Hello. Hi there. All right, they left and you are ready. Have a nice our time to talk with the movie guys and uh, talking about some of the other movies that are playing at the Sawmill Theaters. Another one that will be good for you know everybody in the whole family It's rated PG. It's The Missing Link. The Sir Lionel Frost's last chance for acceptance by the adventuring elite rests on traveling to America's Pacific Northwest to prove the existence of a legendary creature. Dun, dun, dun. So, Tina, I'm sure this is one that you're anxious to rush right out there and... Uh, no. No, okay. In a word? No. No, I haven't seen it. And I, is, this, I is this all animated? Do we know? Claymation. Oh, claymation. oh, that's right, that's the, claymation. the claymation. And, you know, by today's standards, when it comes to all the new digital technology for uh, animated movies, I mean, claymation has been something that's been around since, what, the 50s and 60s? Uh, before that. Even uh, before that? Yeah, the, uh, uh, the first King Kong movie was claymation. Oh, yeah. But, you know, and they're, they're, you, you mold the, the, the figure into a certain position, take a frame or two, then mold it again, take a frame or two. I mean, talk about it. Very, very laborious. Yeah, yeah uh, to say the least. Another caller on the line at 18 and a half past the hour. Hi, you're on Rim Country Forum. Good morning. Craig is uh, out of the room for a moment. Craig is coming back in as we speak. Coming we'll back in. See if we can't get you that yes. movie. Now, for the people that aren't familiar with it, Unplanned is that uh, it's a, a pro-life movie, mm -hmm. and uh, a very interesting story in one of the national networks just this last week that stated that uh, I think it was 150, somewhere between 100 and 150 different uh, uh, Planned Parenthood uh, clinic workers uh, uh, were walking off the job after seeing that movie. Yep. That's, that's what I heard. That's pretty interesting. So uh, uh, Craig's back in the studio with us. Craig, one of the, the questions that our caller had here is, uh, are there any plans? Uh, do we know if we're going to be able to get unplanned uh, here it, to the... Uh, we're, still not, we're still not sure on that one. And this is it, one of these it, things, because it's not that you don't want it, it's just they only released it, it, it to so many Yeah, it, it was a pretty limited release. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they went uh, about 1,100 prints on this. Wow. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, usually, yeah, usually Payson's you know, around 3,000 is when we start getting these things. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we are still looking at it, but uh, yeah, not right now. No no word on if they're going to have a wider release? Or yeah, no, no, nothing yet. Very interesting. Well, thanks for the call. Hopefully we can get a hold of that soon. I've, I've heard wonderful things about the movie, mm -hmm. and I think, uh, demographically speaking, I think it'd be well received in Payson. Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, yeah, this is put out by an outfit called uh, Pure Flicks, mm -hmm. uh, which in, in recent years has been uh, putting out a number of uh, successful uh, faith-based films. And this particular one, uh, in terms of box office success, uh, is already solidly in the profit zone. Nice. E even after, even with considering the limited, the, release. The, the limited release, yeah. Very interesting. Well, now another movie that's playing, and uh, Mike and Debbie went and saw this the other day, and came back just raving about it, and that's The Mustang. Now, the Mustang tells the story of a Roman Coleman, a violent convict who is given the chance to participate in a rehabilitation therapy program involving the training of wild Mustangs, and he apparently wasn't real controllable, and uh, neither was the horse. Um, I've been told this is a great movie. I loved it. I really did. I didn't and, think and you it, loved anything. Well, you know, I, I, I wasn't even cranky. Wow. I, it, really, it must have been an amazing movie. It was, it was, it's a small very slow paced, very, uh, very sweet in a, but not icky sweet. Right. Just uh, so no syrup. No, okay. no, and the, the, the relationship between the man and the horse is not, you know, made into some kind of phony thing. Mm -hmm. It's very, very. Uh, 
please go see this movie, Payson. It's a wonderful movie. The Mustang plays at 134, 30, and 730. It is rated R, and I'm assuming this is because of uh, potty language and that kind of thing? Or? Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's it, you know, it's prison life, and he's a, you know, a very um, miserable and violent guy. And just watching him get a hold of how to relate to this animal hmm. is so beautiful. How's this movie been doing, Craig? I mean, have you been getting a lot of people out to see this? It, you know, it's, it hasn't done badly. It has done great. I would uh, think that this would play really well here. You, you know, I, I, I did actually expect it to do better up here. Huh. It is, does seem like it's a, a pacing type film. Right. And uh, uh, it, we've had crowds, but nothing... Uh, right. Not like it, not like I was expecting. So what about nationally and internationally? Uh, how's that's this been doing that? Ninety-four percent fresh. Ooh, so that yeah. got the, the the critics are less grumpy, just just like uh, Tina. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it hasn't. This hasn't been a big big barn burner. Burner. It's uh, been out a week now. No, actually, it's been out longer than that. Oh, has it? Uh, they, they did one. It was one of these. They they started it last month, I think, actually, but they only released in two theaters, and they kind of. Got to build, 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 built it up slowly. Huh. I, I think they might have. Honestly, I think they might have kind of messed up on the releasing on this thing and, and damaged it. Right. And I think there was a little more hype for it originally, and they went with this mm -hmm. narrow release, and it, uh, yeah. it kind it, of shot their water. Well, right there. sometimes you get into these movies where, you know, Tina said it, it, it it's kind of a, a, a slow paced and, and deliberate film, mm -hmm. uh, a little, little bit artsy, mm -hmm. and sometimes on those art films they, they do them that way, and the uh, uh, studios can. I get spooked by those. Right, interesting. Right, uh, and it was produced by Sundance and Robert Redford, oh, Robert the, Redford. Produ Robert Redford. the producer. And you know, he's he's really done some beautiful smaller movies that uh, that are you know like the Milagro Beanfield War he did. Um, but this is really a sweet oh, movie. It has, it. It, yes, oh, that's a great oh, one. Oh yeah, oh, yes. I'm gonna give me my Kleenex now. <laughs> um, but the Bruce Dern is in it. And he's he's so perfect as this older guy who is just gruff and really helps these inmates. And this is a real program that uh, they train Mustang horses that they capture and they and they tame them, and then they auction them off. And of course, the auction is a poignant thing because the inmates cannot, you know, keep these horses forever. They have to go somewhere. So we've got to say goodbye at some yeah, point. Yeah, it's a really, oh, again, go see this, pay well, the think, country. Uh, and I've been hearing great things from the people who have seen it, so I think it's a must-see. Also, another, uh, you know, westerns seem to be, uh, you, know, you know, it's not something we see a lot of new westerns coming out, but uh, The Kid is another western starring Chris Pratt, uh, Leela George, uh, Ethan Hawke, uh, Vincent uh, uh, Dio, Dio, how do you, heck do you Thank you, what she said. Um, the story of a young boy who witnesses Billy the Kid's encounter with Sheriff Pat Garrett. It's rated R, plays at 115, 415, and 715. Um, did they have a lot of money in this one, Andy? Uh, 37, $37 million. This is uh, what uh, I refer to uh, as an epic fail. Oh, oh really? Yeah, yeah we this, saw it. In uh, Tina, Tina hated it. I didn't. Didn't like it that much, uh, but it's. I was it's cranky. 30, Thirty-seven million. Hey, don't to, candy coat it for us. <laughs> Thirty-seven like million it. to make the thing, and uh, they brought in one and a half million dollars. This is. Uh, I wanted to see it especially because uh, of uh, uh, Vincent. Uh, D'Onofrio. 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 Uh, because he directed it. He's right. a nice guy. Uh, it, he seems yeah. like a, seems like a, a nice guy, and, and he's a great actor. Phil says he's a nice guy. He should know. He knows most of these people. Unfortunately, and, uh, in my opinion, not a good director. So I guess they're waiting for the kid to grow up at this point. Yeah, you know, I, you know I, I think that the the problems not with the direction. I thought the direction was okay. Right. Uh, the the performances were fine. Uh, uh, Ethan Hawke and uh, Chris Pratt uh, are were in it, and both uh, Ethan Hawke, Chris Pratt, and uh, Vincent uh, D'Onofrio yeah. uh, uh, have uh, worked together. Uh, they work worked together in <coughs> all three of them in um, the Magnificent Seven. Wow! Um, yeah, that goes uh, back a few so, days. So you know, I, I think they're they're Which friends. Which was good. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so I wanted to see it, but uh, the the writing uh, is uh, substandard, and they turgid. They turgid. Uh, <laughs> 
they try to they try to work uh, two stories into the same movie, yeah. and it, it just it just it, there's not enough movie there for two stories. Uh, we wanted you know when we see, we hear the move, the name the kid, mm -hmm. well we think well look, we're going to go see a Billy the Kid movie, right. but no, it's not a Billy the Kid movie. It's a story about uh, this kid named Rio, mm -hmm. uh, who encounters uh, Billy the Kid, you know through about two thirds of the movie. So you've got the the kid Rio, and then you've got the the outlaw Billy the Kid, and their their stories are kind of intermingled, and it and it just it just doesn't doesn't work. Right. Well, uh, I did not see this film at all, but uh, I really enjoyed it, and I think everyone should go see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's 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 a it's an interesting movie to see because you it's not a bad idea to see movies that we are saying don't work because you know there are some scene there's some really good scenes in it well and, i think and, and i agree with craig you know that that i mean there are some good scenes in it that are very compelling it's just that the whole thing is a little rocky and disjointed well and i think people should go sure. see the kid just so mm -hmm. that they can call in next week and tell yeah. us how wrong both you and andy are about they this might movie. love it <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? i'm i'm working with you here yeah, craig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know you hear know what she's saying uh, <coughs> You were here t two, three years ago. We did uh, Jupiter Ascending. Right. Oh, oh. This, this big red film. <laughs> well, it is. And, and well, that's my point. Ju Jupiter Ascending didn't really work, but there were some amazing scenes in that film. Yeah. Right. There were some really good shots in it, and, and some some beautiful scenery and stuff. But uh, as a whole, the movie was just di you know same it's thing, dis disjointed and uh, just didn't come together. All right. We got another caller on line twenty eight past the hour. Hi, you're on Rim Country Forum. Good morning. Yeah, Phil, um, the, the question, uh, the, the original Quick and the Dead, was that... Uh, the one with Gene Hackman. And, and, and how, how many years ago was that? Oh, wow. oh gosh, it's, it's over 20 years. No, it wasn't the Sam Elliott version. Oh, okay, so this was the, it was, there was a remake of that, I didn't realize that. Yeah, Gene Hackman, on oh, that blonde gal, I can't remember her name. Sharon Stone. Sharon Stone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. The kid from Titanic. Oh, Leonardo? Um, Leonardo. DiCaprio, yeah. 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 And uh, uh, so you have a chance to get some face time with Leonardo DiCaprio? About two seconds. Uh, yeah, I, was that enough? <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering what... I'm I, not a Hollywood person. Yeah. You know, I, I don't... You know, I have friends that are actors. I mean, very right. good friends that right. I've worked with for years in quite a number of films. Sam Elliott's a wonderful guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Michael Rooker, very good friend of mine. He's like a brother. Sam Elliott just seems like the kind of guy you'd want to go out on a trail ride with. Oh, he seems oh. like the real deal. You yeah. know? Um, hey, we have to take a fast break, get you caught up on today's weather forecast. When we come back, if you tuned in late, uh, we have, of course, the movie guys with us, and we're talking about movies playing at the Sawmill Theaters. But also, as our special guest today, uh, we have Phil Quigley. And again, he's been the, uh, the armor, the guy that provides all the guns and everything for a lot of different movies. He's got some great perspective. We're going to find out a little bit about this morning. Also, our special guest, uh, uh, Phil Quigley, we're going to find out a little bit more about some of his movie experiences here in just a moment. I want to finish things off letting you know what's playing at the Sawmill Theater. So, uh, Shazam is still playing. That's that one about the, the kid who uh, uh, gets this uh, special uh, uh, word that all he has to do is say Shazam. And, he turns into Captain Marvel, who is not nearly as curvy as the most recent Captain Marvel film. But how's Shazam been doing so far? It's still pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it has, it has. I, and this um, is rated PG-13, so it's you know pretty good for the kids, except yeah. for the real little ones, maybe. Not. Yeah, you know there are some. Uh, uh, <coughs> the bad guy is uh, he's a little some, some kind of scary images there. Really? Um, not, nothing real bad, but yeah, I would say keep the, the real little ones out. Right, okay. Um, and again, it plays at uh, 1, 4, and 7. The 4 o'clock showing is in 3D. Uh, have you had a chance to see that in 3D yet, Craig? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, honestly, it's one, uh, um, some movies, they, they do them in 3D, and right. I don't know if they really needed to. This might be one of them. Right. Do we, do we want to talk to the critics about Shazam? Oh, critics liked it. Oh, really? Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you, you did you both see it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I saw it. I thought it, it was fun. Uh, the the setup is that this uh, fourteen year old kid, uh, who is just what you would expect with a fourteen year old kid, uh, can magically turn into a, a, an adult, but. He's still got the 14-year-old kid brain. But all of a sudden he's got this adult superhero body. Yeah, so yeah, you've got right. an adult superhero body. He, can, he has all kind of miraculous powers and whatnot, but he's still 14. Right. And that sets up a whole series of, uh, you know, funny bits that they that they do. Um, this is uh, one of the, the 
two movies this uh, this week that are uh, solidly uh, profitable, <coughs> and so uh, good for them. Uh, 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 Zach Levy, Levy uh, is the uh, protagonist. He's the he's the grown up uh, Shazam character who's actually Captain Marvel. Although they can't use the words Captain Marvel because of uh, trademark infringements, yeah. um, and uh, uh, he had a, a role on TV that ran for like geez, I don't know, seven years or 11 years or something. So uh, he's, you know, the, we, we would recognize him when, if we saw him. Very interesting. Now, the last movie also playing at the Sawmill Theater uh, that's been here for a few weeks, uh, Pet Cemetery, another scary movie. Um, this is uh, uh, kind of a, uh, not a sequel, but a remake of the original Pet Cemetery, right? Remake, yes, yes. After the Creed family's cat is killed by a truck, Dad resorts to burying it in the mysterious Pet Cemetery which is definitely not as it seems. It's rated R, place at 130, 430, and 730. As we mentioned last week, I saw the, the original Pet Cemetery, and that was a, was a pretty screwy, spooky movie. Yeah, yeah, and this I, one is uh, even spookier. I, I really like this. Really? <laughs> this, is, uh, this is some good horror. Uh, not just... Uh, some good horror. <laughs> well, you know, we, we talked, you know, La Llorona is a lot of the, the jump the scare, horror. you know, just boo, you know, that, right. that type of thing. This one it kind of gets into a little bit of the, the psychological. So a little more cerebral. Uh, yes, okay. yes, and that kind of, you know, the, the the wife has this, you know, kind of messed up childhood that, that kind of carries into the film and uh, just yeah. makes it worse. And um, I, I really liked it. Right. Yeah. And, and this and, is uh, Stephen King, oh, and, uh, and he's naturally. So uh, we get a lot of the, um, you know, the deep seated uh, psychological traumas. Uh, come oozing out uh, uh, from Pet Cemetery. And as we've mentioned here before, I mean, Stephen King is one of those guys that I'm not sure I'd want to invite over for the weekend. At, at one point in his career, <laughs> you could, Bill is shaking his head. No, you don't. <laughs> at, at one point in his career, you could uh, you could pay some astronomical amount of money and <clears throat> go out and uh, sit around the campfire with him, and he would tell ghost stories, which I think would would be fun, but boy, I bet it would be really creepy too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds interesting. Yeah. This kind of goes from, uh, kind of crosses from horror into tragedy. Right. Yeah, it, it's a, a it's, it's kind of a tragic story. Yeah, it's not, right. not just a horror, it's, it's tragic. Well, and as always, you can always find out what's playing and when it's playing by just going online to sawmilltheaters.com. And then you can also, as we always tell you on Fridays, you can call Chris or Craig rather 24 hours a day at 602-377-0719. He loves the uh, the late night calls too. Yeah. Now um, this might might be uh, might be a tragedy, Pet Cemetery. Really? Uh, but boy, they're making money like crazy. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. They've got a. Uh, Twenty-one million dollar uh, investment, and they've got eighty-three million back at the box office Some so far. Serious ROI and, uh, there. And this guy, this one's got legs. This is going to be in the theaters here probably, I think, for another two or three weeks, and then uh, we'll see it on TV and DVDs and whatever else they have these days. Very interesting. Well, now as we, uh, if you tuned in late, we were mentioning earlier we have a special guest with <coughs> us today, Phil Quigley. Phil's got a long history uh, in law enforcement. But uh, uh, for about 30 years, he's also been doing some, some pretty interesting uh, uh, gun work with uh, engraving and things like that. But has, has done, uh, uh, what was it, for 20-some years, you've been doing movies. Uh, well, almost 25 years. Yeah. And uh, when it comes to this, uh, it's a lot more than just, okay, you need some period-correct guns, which, I mean, I think we've all seen movies where all of a sudden you... You know, it's set in the 1800s, and you see someone reach out, and they got a Timex watch on her. I mean, you know, some little snafu like that. But uh, your job with the guns, one of the aspects of it, is to make sure that everything is is period correct. Exactly. And then, and, and but there's more of that. You you actually have to spend time uh, training some of these actors how to shoot and things like that. Yeah, if they're going to handle a firearm on a set, we have to spend time with them, uh, teaching them. And I usually use live rounds. Mm -hmm. uh, Master and Commander, I didn't because those are flintlock. Right. So I just use paper wads mm -hmm. uh, and teach them how to uh, make them recoil. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with the flintlocks on Master and Commander, for instance, is uh, if, if you're close, there's a lot of close on deck shooting in that film. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the shots are literally right in one man's face. I mean, they're closer than you and I right now. Wow. And uh, for instance, when the uh, the doctor and the young boy uh, in the big battle at the Toward the late part of the film, when they're going into the French ship and they come through that hole in the side of the ship, the boy reaches up and points the gun at the guy and shoots it at him. Well, 
probably only about 12, 14 inches from his face. Well, how do you get away with that without somebody getting Well, it's offside, off, off, off one. The, side. the other thing is that all the flintlocks that are used in close shooting, I take them and kind of beat them up a little bit. I go back in, you know, they all have what's called a touch hole on the side where the hammer drops and ignites the powder and goes in. And that touch hole is quite small. It's maybe a sixteenth of an inch diameter at the maximum. Uh, I couldn't I drill them out almost to a quarter inch. Oh wow. I mean the, the guns are really going through with them. Uh, I drill them way out. We never put any powder in the bore. You fill a pan, tip it over a little bit to put the so it dumps into the base of the bore. Bring it back, pan it up again and then close the fritz in and you can shoot it and you'll get a beautiful little flash out of the muzzle and smoke. No pressure. You could hold it against your hand. But there's no pressure. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! Mm -hmm. It's really safe to shoot that way. Mm -hmm. And we run around with tissue paper and test our shots depending on how close we're going to be to somebody. We'll try to shoot a whole tissue paper. And if it doesn't go through tissue paper, then it's probably going to relatively be safe, except yeah. for anywhere near anyone's eyes. Sure. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So now, out of um, uh, roughly how many movies? Uh, I've, I've done. done I've worked on 14 big pictures. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked predominantly with a man named Thel Reed who's been in the business for over 50 years. I mean, he's just been around forever. Wow. Uh, Thel's older than I am, and I'm no kid. Uh, but we work for the big you know, production houses on major, major films. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Now, the, uh, uh, when it comes to uh, having to, to train actors, uh, are, are, have there been any actors that were maybe especially difficult when it came to that? I won't tell you that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Didn't know if I could lure you into that one or not. <laughs> no, it doesn't say stupid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he suddenly never got any more movies. <laughs> you know, there, there are some actors that are very difficult to work with. Uh -huh. uh, quite a number of them are really decent people. So uh, let me rephrase that and not talk about the actor, but in the types of things that you have to teach them. I mean, were there some for a particular type of, of well, gun? I've been very frustrated with a few actors on a scene, on a set. I just like to hit them upside the head with a pistol. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, after the ninth take, right. and the director's now looking at me, right. why can't she shoot this pistol? I said, she's stupid. <laughs> I mean, you know, All right, so we know it's a she. I'm making notes. I've already, I've already trained her. You know, I've had a week with her to show her how to do this. Right. And we're trying to operate a... Um, 1851 Navy percussion. Oh, wow. Okay, and it's been converted, so it's not a percussion. It looks like it, but it's got little blanks in it. Right. All she has to do is cock it, shoot it, cock it three times. Bang, bang, bang. Uh, about the ninth or tenth take before she finally got it. <laughs> That's point of killer. And then we'll go from that scene right into the saloon where she's going to shoot these three guys, mm -hmm. and we had to go back in. She's supposed to put her hand up there beside the camera and do what's called a hand insert and go bam, bam, bam. Right? Never happened. Couldn't do it. I did the hand insert. Uh, <laughs> you just cut away and it, all of a sudden it makes all sense, yeah. right? Yeah. So, uh, uh, with the, the uh, you've done a, a movies from a number of different eras, obviously going back to using flintlocks and things like that up to uh, uh, current day guns. Proof of Life is M4s, M60s, you know, for right. all weapons. Right. And, and what kind of work do you have to do on those kind of guns? I mean, do you have to do something to prepare those guns? Well, for the generally time? the production house that we lease from the firearms from, right. they've run their guns and made sure they work. And then we'll test fire them on the set to make sure they're working. The production houses are really good about making stuff run because we have to send it back. It costs them money. Right. And I don't like sending things back because then I have a director down my shirt collar. Right. Makes sense. The guns have to what we call run. What was the most difficult movie of all the ones you've worked on? Oh. I mean, is there one that just it was an, a special booger without having to say, you know, who was boogering it up? Well, there's been some difficult actors. I, I, Phil and I did a little western down in Old Tucson, geez, 20 years ago. It's awful. I mean, it's not even a great C movie. It's way below that. <laughs> but we're, the director M now. <laughs> the director was a friend of mine, and I built the lead character's gun. And then he turned around and asked me if, if uh, you know, if I'd do the armory for him, because I was living in Tucson at the time. I said, oh, okay, so Phil and I will do it. Oh, and will you take a part in the movie? I went, oh, gosh, I don't want anything to do with that nonsense. He said, no, no, I need a, I need a victim for a couple of days. It's perfect. <laughs> right. 
So I got hung in that movie, <laughs> <laughs> which was a lot of fun. Yeah, I bet. Well, every time I well, go it was quite a stretch for you, I'm sure. Every time I go for ladder, it's 500 bucks. I don't care. <laughs> it's just called a stunt up. I mean, yeah, right. right. At any rate, that movie was a total pain in the fanny. That was the one that the lady was on that was so difficult. Well, now, you know, for people that don't know you, and of course, you know, can't see you here on radio, I mean, to me, you seem like you would be a perfect person to have in the position of Wyatt Earp. I mean, you've got the mustache, you've got the look. I mean, have you been in any westerns like that where you, you were on camera uh, just, you know... Well, I was in that one, uh, but not playing a, a martial artist, I got played a farmer in that film. Right. Um, we got the scenes shot that I was done with the lead actor in that film, who is not much of an actor, walked over to me and said, your eyes scared me to death. Yeah, he was, <laughs> well, they should. <laughs> <laughs> there was one scene we were filming, uh, the, the town sheriff and a guy were talking, and the sheriff was supposed to be afraid in that film. When he was a Canadian actor, he was terrible. Yeah. And he didn't look afraid. And Alex came over and says, can you scare that guy so he at least looks a little bit afraid? I said, sure. <laughs> Uh, away for a few minutes. Uh, 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 <laughs> well, that sounds like fun. He was, he was like this when he was shaking. Oh, he was scared to come out of it. Oh, lovely. I, I, like I have a question for Phil because my husband is, uh, you know, just loves to to look at all the firearm scenes. Quickly down under. Yes. Your name. I'm, funny story. I was in Australia oh. working undercover for the government on a project when that film was done. Wow. So and quickly I know, was down I know my, <laughs> my husband always says it's really not. The, the movie about the characters, the movie is about the gun, which was yeah. you know, the, the, the Shiloh Sharp 1870. Yeah, the Sharps rifle. Right, right. Shiloh was the company that made the reproduction pieces. Right, and he's just, I mean, you know, every time we see that that's going to be on, it's like, oh man, we have to focus on the rifle. It's very cool. So how much research do you have to do when it comes to, okay, uh, they're hiring you on to do XYZ movie, you know, set in a certain time period. I mean, how much time do you spend just researching exactly what kind of guns uh, need to be used in, in the, the scenes that you're 20 doing? minutes. As soon as I can read the script, because right. I know most of it. But you've seen my studio. I've got a pretty good yeah. library. You definitely do. So I can research real quickly what's, what's needed. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the show, too, uh, Phil has uh, uh, been contracted by a number of very uh, famous... Uh, actors to produce guns. Uh, so he's also our special guest in the studio this morning, Phil Quigley, uh, who has uh, uh, provide armoring services for a lot of different uh, movies. And uh, uh, one of the things, we were just talking during the, uh, the break there, and, and Tina, you were talking about a specific movie that you had a question for Phil, and man, his response just blew my mind. I hadn't heard about this particular incident of, of how things can really go wrong. In well, the actually, the Craig brought it up, and I'm really glad he did, because it was the movie The Crow, with Brandon Lee, who is Bruce Lee's son, and of course Bruce Lee's death is shrouded in mystery. Sure. mystery. And you ever Brandon, seen that guy play ping pong with nunchucks? Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, anyway, I, I'm a big Bruce Lee fan. Yeah, so, I hear yeah. you. But he, uh, but Brandon Lee was uh, tragically killed by a gun carelessness. I believe it was what Phil said. So I think Phil. So how did this happen? About this. Well, when they were filming, uh, they were doing some takes on. Uh, that big Smith and Wesson model 2944 Magnum, and they were filming straight onto the muzzle, so you had to have bullets in the cylinder because when it rotates, you can see that there's bullets. Otherwise, there's, there's nothing in there. Mm -hmm. And then they would CG in the muzzle flash. Well, they picked six cartridges that were supposed to be uh, dead blanks, and the way you, we make them up all the time, the primers, I'll either snap them off, or I'll throw them in a tank of acid, which will kill the primer, mm -hmm. and I'll leave it in there a week. At any rate, the primers were loaded. I did not work on that film. Uh, neither did my friend Phil Reed. But, but, but the gun was loaded. They did the film on to the muzzle. So the camera is looking right down the muzzle of the gun. Or Correct. Right into the muzzle from the front. And you can see the front of the cylinder rotate and stuff. Oh, right. So it went clack, clack, oh. snap, clack. And the one that snapped was a primer that was live. Mm -hmm. And it drove that bullet out of that case into the barrel about an inch and a half. So it just lodged it in the just barrel? Just lodged it in the barrel. Huh. Then the gun was put away, and then about a month and a half later when it got out for the shooting scene with, with uh, Mr. Lee, um, it was loaded with full flash blanks. But no one ever checked the bore. Oh my goodness. No one ever put a rod down the bore. We don't go on set. I mean, I, I wear a vest, looks like a fishing vest. In fact, it is. It, it's got hooks everywhere for stuff, and then one of them is a big rod that I have. It goes, I, I leave it in the barrel until I hand the gun to the actor. Right. And he can see, I'll pull it out and say, see, it's, it's empty. There's nothing there. 
so in this particular instance, they didn't realize there was still a slug in the barrel. The, the uh, right. blank, blank powered it through, and, and it actually it killed him instantly. Huh? Yeah, the full flash blank has just <coughs> almost as much power as a normal load. Right. And it was enough to drive the bullet down the bore, and it hit Mr. Lee right in the heart. So people doing what you do for movies, I mean, there's there's a lot to, uh, um, and this is, in a sense, much like being a range master. I mean, you're looking out for people's safety as well as their technique and how they shoot, teaching them how to do that, and then just making sure everything is kept safe. Yeah, you know, my first job on set is keep everybody safe. Right. Make sure the actor looks good. So we train them with live rounds on the uh, locations or in L.A. before they ever go out on set. Mm -hmm. We spend a lot of time on set with the directors to make sure that the shooting scenes are safe mm -hmm. because uh, close proximity to eyes and faces and things. Uh, or we have some guns built up I can hold right against your chest and pull the trigger. They look cool, but the barrel's solid. Well, there's no hole in it. No, no well, it's, we've welded it shut. Right. And then just back from that, it'll have little cuts in it to let the flash out. So when I hold it up against your shirt, you don't see those things, and it goes off. The flash comes, and it looks good. Right. But it doesn't even leave work on his shirt. Wow. That's interesting. So. Gosh, uh, it's, uh, it's fascinating, the work that you've done. I want to uh, try a, a previous question, but in a much more positive way. Out of all the movies that, uh, that you've done, is there one actor who really seemed to be just a real natural when it came to handling guns, obviously had some history and, and there's two of my it off real quick? There's two of my very good friends in Hollywood, well, three, uh, who are absolute naturals. Samuel is pretty good. Oh, I bet. Michael Rooker is superb. He's very fast. He's a very good shooter. Michael Rooker, remind me, what would we know him from? I'm trying to put uh, a face. Cliffhanger. Oh, okay. Uh, there's quite a bit of things. He's, he's, he's had some awards. You know, he was a good actor. Uh, well, that sci-fi thing he just did. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, wow. He uh, he's good. the blue man in there. Oh, okay. Yes. Wow. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Michael's been a, a good shooter for a long, long time. I did a beautiful pair of guns for him 20 years ago. Hmm. Um, and then Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe. Uh -huh. Russell can shoot. And I mentioned earlier, you did a couple of amazing guns for him, just for his yeah. personal collection. It took us almost a year to get them down to, to him in Australia. What, what kind of guns were those? Colt. The Colt. 1911s in 9mm. Wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, and those were ones that you spent quite a bit of time doing all the engraving. About three months on, of course. Wow. wow. That's amazing. And, and roughly speaking, when it comes to, I mean, some of the stuff you've done is, is truly museum grade. Yes. Um, I was trained by a man from London, from Holland, Holland. Right. which is the premier gun makers in the world. Hmm. I spent eight years with him, and I've learned how to engrave most of the styles of the world other than the Italian Molino, which is the little dotty stuff, which I don't So there's a, there's, I didn't realize there's a lot of different styles. That's how out of many, touch I am. Wow. And, and so uh, uh, when it comes to one of those kinds of guns, and I'm sure there's just a, a ton of variables involved, but what kind of price tag do you put on something like that once it's all done? Well, things that I do, uh, I uh, hardly touch a gun anymore for under ten thousand. Right. Uh, m some of my guns have been one hundred and fifty grand. Uh, the American Patriot was about that price. It it appraised at two hundred fifty thousand when I was done with it. And it seems like I remember you showing me pictures of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's all gold inlay, twenty four karat gold. The grips are solid, uh, white gold with diamonds, rubies, and sapphires, pave in the shape of an American flag. And, and obviously this is not something you take out and go target practicing with. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you're talking $150,000 for that gun? A quarter of a million. A quarter, oh, 250, wow. I mean, that's, uh, and he's passing around pictures here. I had s almost $70,000 in the stones. Extraordinary. And, and, I mean, just, just the, the grip on that, because you've got, you know, for people that uh, you know can't see this, I mean, in the handle you've got uh, white and red stripes. Hold it up like to the, the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like the, like the uh, American flag with all these little stones. And how long does it take to set all of that? It took seven months for me to set those. you got to be inventing mm -hmm. new dirty words. Oh, I, mean, I, I have a vocabulary that's <laughs> far and cheap. Everything you can say <laughs> in video. <laughs> that's right. But I mean, it's, uh, the, the, the painstaking uh, uh, detail, I mean, you obviously have great patience and a great eye. Um, eight years of uh, studying under someone that uh, apparently must have had a, a long history prior to you getting together with him? Linton had been cutting for Hollins for 20 years. Wow. Uh, and, and also Purdy. He was one of the top five in the world, premier engraver. Hmm. Uh, I spent eight years with him. He gave me my master's ticket after five. Wow. 
Normally it takes 10 years, I got it in five. And, and he, again, you've done some of these for some pretty noteworthy names. Got any other names you want to drop as far as some of the folks that have, no. you don't want to do that at all? Okay, I understand. The, 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 the American Patriot, which is the pistol I showed you a picture of, right. was done for the retired um, Deputy Commissioner of New York City after 9 11. Wow. It's a 9 11 dedication. Oh. Wow. He, he's a very, very wealthy man. He used to be with Merrill Lynch years ago. Right. Wow. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. and, uh, are you, and you're still doing this kind of work today? Yes. And I know that you have a movie that you're getting ready to work on that we can't talk about that either, but uh, um, hopefully once that all happens, I'd love to get you back here and talk about we'll it all, some more. We'll see what would happen. With right. it. Be, it should be fun because it's this particular actor's first Western. And uh, very interesting. And, and as far as, and it's a well-known actor too, we'll just leave it at that. Um, we do have another caller on the line, now let's go back to the phones. Hi, you're on Rim Country Forum. Good morning. Hi. What's a real popular Winchester? A real popular Winchester from the 18th It depends what, what cartridges are you looking at. If you're looking pistol cartridges, the 1873, and there's lots of reproductions now by Uberti and everybody else. The originals are very expensive. Uh, Model 92s were also pistol cartridges, but if you go to the 94 in Winchester, you could get up to the rifle cartridges. Well, what, uh, the further back you go, if you get back to the Henrys, go get a bank. <laughs> <laughs> Gets a little pricey, huh? Oh my God! What, what kind of money are you talking about for something like that? Eighty hundred thousand. Wow, that's a lot. And again, these are these are these are guns for a collection to look yeah, at. Yeah, you're, you're talking about supreme condition firearms that have been in collections for years and they're well documented. Lots of provenance. Um, I, I've seen several of the originals. I have a very good friend of mine, I won't even tell you where he lives. If you look at the best engraving books in the world of early Winchesters, he owns about half of them. Wow. Uh, his vault in his house is bigger than my house just for the vault. And my guess would be that uh, they do nothing but appreciate and value. Yeah, they don't lose money. Wow, very interesting. Ever. So uh, might be an interesting area to do some investing in. Um, <laughs> next time I need to invest eighty or a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> don't think that's going to happen this week, but you never know. Um, fascinating work. And, and uh, uh, what's the most unusual gun you've ever worked on? The Winter Gun. When I was working with Linton as a student, I was with him about the fourth year, a little more. He was working on a piece that he'd received from London. I had been made many, many years ago, that I won't tell you the year yet, but the, there were so many inlays of silver and gold in the stock. The trigger bow was solid, 24 karat gold, and big cherubs, uh, wow. 16 bore fouling piece with its leather and gold case. This is a stunning firearm. Leather and gold case? Yeah. Sewn with gold thread. Wow. Stunning case. Was owned at one time by Josephine. Flip okay. Wilson's alter ego? Yeah. No. <laughs> the uh, silver inlays in the stock on the right side, it was a big village scene with silver and gold and, and platinum. Because of the years of its age, had, the wood had shrunk and was forcing the silver to pop up out. So Linton's job was to pull it back out, re-inlet it, set it back. Well, when he got that piece out, there was an edge of silver that joined. Underneath it was a small little cut down in the wood, like a little box. Mm -hmm. And we dug in there for two and a half hours with pieces of silver wire and pulled out a little rolled up piece of paper and unrolled it. Uh, 1652 at Lyon and the name of the armor that made the gun. Wow. wow. So it kind of a little time capsule. But it documented. It was oh a fabulous piece of paper. Wow. wow. Uh, and so and what would a gun like that be worth? One, one million. One, just And even one million. Wow. It's worth more now, but that's what it was. Yeah. Great, that's amazing. Well, Phil, we need to get you back here, especially after this uh, next movie. I want to find out more about it because, again, this is an actor that you don't typically think of when it comes to Western, so I'm anxious to talk more. Um, we definitely appreciate you coming in this morning. If you ever have a chance to go to Phil Quigley's shop and look at his guns uh, and the work that he does, absolutely outstanding stuff. And we appreciate him being here. And, of course, we appreciate the movie guys being here. Thank you all this morning, and we'll look forward to being at back after this next Friday as well. Yes, go to the Sawmill Theater. That's right. Specifically see the Mustang. Yeah, and check out all the movies Yay. and when they're playing at uh, sawmilltheaters.com. And, uh, of course, tune in Fridays right here for your hometown movie, guys, on KMOG.